Matthew Fisher is Canada's longest serving foreign correspondent. He covers international affairs for Post Media and joins us now in what has become a much anticipated annual visit to offer some insight into what to watch for in international news in 2016. Matt, always great to have you back here. Lovely to be with you, Steve. How many countries last year? 33. 33? Any new ones? Yes, Iceland. Every Canadian should go there. I commend it to them. Fantastic place. Cheap flights from several destinations in Canada now. Hmm. And very expensive when you get there, but lovely people. Chile, and uh, that was also extremely interesting. Maybe the only country in South America that works properly. And Morocco, which huh. I found absolutely fascinating in a place where a lot of refugees were gathering to get into Europe, one of the many places hmm. where they were gathering to get into Europe. You do get around, sir. All right. I, uh, because we like to do this, we like to sort of trot out things you said the previous year and check on them a year later. So shall we do that again, just for old yeah, time's yeah, sake? Yeah, you probably catch me with my pants down. Not right at all. Here. No, no, no. You're usually very prescient. Here we go. Here's uh, our Matthew Fisher from one year ago on this program. Let's roll it. We were looking for great things in the Middle East with the Arab Spring. That's all forgotten now. And it's amazing we're looking... how that's fallen off the radar, right? Nobody's, nobody's looking for good news out of the Middle East anymore. It's totally the Arab winter. It's the Arab winter now. Huh. Anything happened in the past year to change your mind about that? Yes, uh, to give me a more negative opinion than I had a year ago, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the Middle East is a shambles. There, there are new elements there. One of them is the war in Yemen. Uh, another one is the escalating war of words and where it might lead between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the war in Syria got worse. Maybe there are a few good things to see from the Western perspective. Uh, in uh, Iraq, uh, but not much. And of course, the entire area is hemorrhaging people. Uh, so Did you see it, that coming? I would say yes, I saw some of it company, coming, but I of course did not mm -hmm. anticipate that a million people would end up in Europe. But I had visited the camps in Jordan, and I'd seen hundreds of thousands of people there languishing, doing nothing, and uh, wanting to go somewhere, and many of them had suffered terribly. And, and so, yes, I, I did see it coming. I think anybody who'd been in the camps had seen it coming, but not in the way it exploded. We saw initially, certainly, Germany and Sweden in particular with a very magnanimous attitude towards taking, uh, you know, just a disproportionate number of refugees relative to other countries around the world. Based on your read of it now, has that magnanimity changed? Totally. It is absolutely, you could use that fancy French word, volte face, uh, an about face. Mm -hmm. uh, the opinion has changed on a dime. I notice in Canada, opinion, you might say, is sort of at the stage it was in Sweden or Germany eight or nine months ago. But over there, uh, it has changed. Uh, I, I went to Sweden in the summer, and you could sense it in some of the small towns. I visited small towns uh, in southern Sweden where 20, 30 percent of the population were Arab, and where in the middle, in the town square, uh, every park bench was occupied by Arab gentlemen. Uh, playing with their worry beads and passing the time of day. Uh, very strange because, you know, usually when you go to Swedish small towns, uh, they're extremely quiet. Nobody is out in the streets. The Swedes are so famously private. And, of course, the Arabs like to live their lives on the street, and they're great communicators. They, they like to hang out and talk. Uh, and so culturally, you could see it there. And... Uh, I met pensioners there who used to sit on those park benches, who were much, much taken aback that those park benches were now occupied by uh, much more talkative Arabs hmm. uh, than them. Uh, so, so it changed. The, I wasn't in Germany a lot with refugee. I was in Germany earlier in the year, but not on the refugee story, but certainly when I went back there in late November, early December, uh, the backlash was incredible. I went to uh, rallies of Pegida, which is this extreme right-wing movement there. Uh, 100,000 people were there, and an awful lot of people who weren't there sort of found they were worried about them. Yeah, they're neo-Nazis and all of this, and Germans, of course, still have a lot of problems with that, but some of the other things they say, well, they're pretty sharp, you know. And, and what they had to say was very sharp and very, very, very negative. Well, here's what we've had to say, uh, and I read about this in your column. On Canada's plan to accept 25,000 refugees, you wrote, it is commendable 
that Canada has accepted several thousand Syrian refugees this year and that it has promised to take in as many as 50,000 over the next year or two. It is heartening to discover that many Canadians want to help the newcomers get here and to settle in. But the orgy of congratulatory backslapping that has gripped the country for several months now is way over the top. A little perspective is urgently required. What's the perspective you think we need to get? We seem to have this idea in Canada that we are unique, that they, we are the most loving, inclusive, fair, generous nation in the world. And I find this self-righteousness, this sanctimonious uh, attitude uh, outrageous because there are many other countries uh, uh, who have done more for refugees and for longer, have spent more money, whose citizens have privately done more, whose governments have done more. Well, Germany and Sweden. For uh, Germany, Germany right and Sweden. There. And uh, Finland is another very good example. A small country, very similar to ours in terms of climate and remoteness uh, from the Middle East, uh, that has been very generous. So we delude ourselves. Canadians have a lot of delusions about themselves in the world. And I think one of those delusions can came to the fore here that somehow we are unique. That Maybe not we unique, do but we, we did, when the boat people thing happened in the late 1970s, we stepped up to the plate. Many people have stepped up to the plate now. Uh, certainly the Ukrainian community, for example, has gone to bat for, for Ukraine uh, when the chips are down. Um, but that doesn't make us unique. And it, okay. I don't think, the, the problem is that we, those are good things. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying these are not good things that Canada did. My thing is we should not congratulate ourselves. What we should be thinking about, I think, far more is how do we make this successful, particularly with this European backlash? Mm. How are we truly going to be different? How are we going to accept these people? How are these people going to accept us? When you say, so, though, that given Canada's multicultural history and the way we seem to integrate people, maybe better than anybody else in the world, that we got a pretty good shot at getting this right? Well, again, I think you're being a little bit too generous, Steve. I think there are other countries such as New Zealand and Australia uh, that also do a fair job of this. And the United States uh, is uh, extremely multicultural. Not they, doing much on the Syrian thing. They're not doing much on the no. Syrian thing, but uh, in terms of welcoming people from all over the world, the Hmong people, the Vietnamese, uh, huge numbers of people from Latin America, and there's been a backlash in many places in the United States, but they also are a multicultural society. I think Canada has, until now, done quite a good job on all of this, but we must understand that this crisis represents a different kind of challenge because the cultural differences are quite substantial and uh, we must do our level best to integrate these people and educate them to our morality and our mores and I think that is a little bit more different. Canada has taken people for a long time and sometimes in the case of the Chinese or the Indians or the Jews uh, has failed at different times mm -hmm. in its history. But when it has succeeded, uh, those people have also been willing to adapt. And also, if you look at the Indians who came to Canada or the Jews who came to Canada, they adapted very well. They wanted to be Canadian. They, they committed themselves okay. to so we'll, so we'll watch and see how this so one works out. This is a difficult challenge. I'm not saying we can't do it, and I'm not saying they can't do it, but I think it represents a, a higher hurdle to get over. Okay. Since you were last here, we, of course, have a new government, a yes. new government of Canada, a new prime minister, Justin Trudeau. As you look at, admittedly, he's only a few months on the job, but as you look at how foreign policy has changed under his leadership, what do you see? Well, we certainly have a, a policy that I could su sum up in one word, kumbaya. Meaning what? Uh, meaning what? That's that old song about, uh, from Africa. No, that I we get that. All but, get but, along. But how do you see that unfolding? Well, it is a mantra that's repeated all over the place. We heard it when the Prime Minister spoke at Davos about uh, he wanted to stress that Canada would show hum a humanitarian face to the world, that really that was the leading priority. This puts us very much out of sync right now with all of our allies. Uh, most countries in the world have been moving to the right. Canada has not moved to the right. And in terms of foreign policy, uh, Canada, uh, under the new government, is talking about uh, a very different attitude towards the world. Well, that's fine, 
but we also have allies, we also have relationships. And right now, those relationships, even in the three months this government has been in power, has frayed a lot. I, we still, I think, are underestimating how angry uh, the Europeans, particularly the French, are about Canada's policy on the Middle East. And this matters because we've been deep with the French for centuries. Well, let's look, uh, let's look south. I mean, uh, and the, then there's the United well, States. There's yeah, a disconnect except there. Prime Minister Trudeau and President Obama. It doesn't apparently. matter. Obama's finished this year. It Obama's doesn't got, matter. He's got another a, year to go. He's, he's a lame duck president. Well, not yet. And he's not. He's still got a year. No, no. The last year is always called the lame duck presidency. And also on this issue in the Middle East, I don't think that uh, Obama or people in his government are very happy about Canada. Certainly his defense secretary is not. Certainly his secretary of foreign affairs, John Kerry, uh, is not at all happy well, with they Canada. They don't like that, that Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau has said that he wants to stop the bombing missions over ISIS targets. Yes, However, and... However, the, the missions are still going on, though. Yes, of course. This is... Uh, this is uh, a government that is dithering and uh, doesn't know how or whether uh, to honor its prom promises or what, frankly, to do going forward. Because you say they're just in power, but I say they've been in power for three months, and that was a big platform, a big plank of their pa platform during the election. So you are right to say, yes, it's still going. I think the plan is uh, they have the act of the old parliament uh, that pre uh, uh, permitted this campaign. It expires in March next month, and it will quietly expire, and that will be it. Uh, there will no, not be a new motion to support the bombing, and that is the way. So they'll say they never really cancelled it. Uh, it, it just the authorization the ran out, and that's uh, it. And that was it. And, and to avoid a debate Take on. Take us this behind thing. the scenes, though. Do, how much? How intense do you think the pressure is on the prime minister right now from our allies to keep those missions going? I don't think the pressure is intense because I think they've given up on Canada. I, I think they they expect nothing from this government at all. The Prime Minister's forward. explanation, though, is that he intends to continue to make a contribution to that mission, just in a different way. His explanation, you don't accept that? No, his explanations are... Uh, he tries to use a bit of sophistry, but he has not told us at all what his plan is. It is time for him to explain exactly what he means by this. Well, he's talked about... He's talked... First of all, talked he's talked about... Hang on. He said, no boots on the ground, no jets in the sky, but we're good at training, we're good at intelligence, we'll do that. This is a minimal contribution. We can help with training, but training is more dangerous, frankly, than the, the missions we're conducting from the air. Uh, even on the training side, what we're talking about is a contribution of only a couple of hundred more trainers. Uh, and what we must understand is the Harper government did almost nothing in the Middle East itself. Mm -hmm. The number of fighter jets we have there, we had six. Oh, six. During, yeah. during the, the war against Saddam Hussein in 1991, Canada had 26 CF-18 Hornet mm -hmm. jets fighting. Uh, the Harper government talked a very big game and did the minimum. Now we have a government that's talking a very big, different game and doing even less than the Harper minimum. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to understand that we have relationships. It's like the F-35 and uh, the Americans and NORAD. These things matter. What you bring to the table, how they integrate. Canada, for decades, has been heavily involved and has prized its relationship with NORAD, uh, with NATO. And these relationships must be fostered. And when you have a government that basically is retreating from the world while saying Canada's back in the world, uh, it's a paradox. Well, you say and, retreating in the world, but uh, maybe retreating militarily, but in terms of humanitarian relief. Yes, Look Canada at the under the Harper Syria. government was number one or number two in the world in its humanitarian response in the Middle East. The difference was they never celebrated it. It was almost like they were embarrassed to say that Canada made a great contribution. Now this new government is all the time talking about this. Well, Canada has always done a good job vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations and contributing financially. This mm. is not new. It, it is a new branding that's taking place. Okay, let me get you to look south because he's not a... I'm going to go back at you on this. He's not a lame duck technically yet. He's a lame duck after the election in, in November before the next president is sworn in. Obama's still got almost a year left to be president. He does. So in that year, do you expect him to make any major initiatives on the foreign policy front? 
he finally seems to be moving uh, in the Middle East on getting things together about uh, ISIS, Islamic State, mm -hmm. fighting them. Uh, he does have two considerable foreign policy triumphs, I think, Iran and Cuba. You like the Iran deal, don't I you? I like lots of it, but, oh. but people are right to be very wary of Iran. <laughs> Please don't think that I'm saying Iran has suddenly become great guys. They haven't. But I think it is necessary after decades that we speak with Iran, that Canada should speak with Iran too, and that somehow uh, we seek a way to get along with them. And so for me, that is important. So you disagree with every Republican presidential candidate right now who thinks this Iran deal is awful? Yeah. That the U.S. are giving them Yes, I do. Them a, okay, you, you do. All no. right, okay, no, fair I enough. Uh, but I, I do think we must be very cautious about them. But we have to engage uh, the enemy sometimes. You can't engage Islamic State, but you can engage Iran, if I can make uh, that uh, distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm under no illusions about what Iran is as a government. Their people want something very different than what their government gives them, particularly in terms of their foreign policy. But uh, what we're seeing, I think, is a greater engagement on the war on terror. This conference in Paris, uh, there are going to be a number of follow-up meetings that the United States, in concert with France, is trying to show leadership and greater coordination. There's still a great reluctance to commit the kind of combat forces on the ground that I think are required there. But the bombing has had some effect, particularly in Iraq, less so in Syria, and there's the Russian complication there. But... Uh, so I think that is what you're going to see more of in the next year. But mostly, uh, the Obama presidency has been terrible for the world and for American prestige because of the advances that China and Russia and Islamic State have made. Let me pick up on that. Because Obama only has a year left in the presidency, do you imagine that maybe it's Russia, maybe it's China, maybe it's another country, will... Take advantage is maybe the wrong expression, but you know what I'm getting at here. Let's say take advantage of the fact that he's not long for us and maybe more adventurous on the foreign policy front. I think that's what's happened in the last 18 months, not because he was a lame duck president, but because he was a lame president. Huh. And now in the last year, I think there's the extra element of his, whether you think he's a lame duck president <laughs> well, or not Well, he's got a year yet. left. <laughs> but uh, so he is entering the phase where he's a lame duck president. Okay. Uh, perhaps we could agree on that. And uh, in that context, uh, China, I think, uh, will continue to uh, shake the cage. They've got all kinds of economic problems at home. Every government that has problems at home looks for things overseas that get their people feeling right. so good about themselves. what cage do they want Jingle. to shake? The South China Sea cage, the East China Sea cage. Uh, Taiwan? Uh, Taiwan, yes, but I think even more so because it always sells well in China, Japan. Hmm. Uh, Korea is there and also try to divide Korea from Japan, which is pretty easy because the Koreans and the Japanese don't get along very well with each other. But also further south, the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, all these countries. And where the United States could do something and is trying, but I don't think not, uh, not hard enough, is to improve the relations. Uh, across this arc in Asia. Canada's nowhere on this, by the way. Uh, Canada wants to trade with Asia, but doesn't think, and that's true of the Harper government, it's true of the Trudeau government. Uh, Canadians should be more engaged about Asia because it is so important to us and we are a Pacific nation. We are a Pacific nation. Those of us uh, who live in Ontario don't necessarily think of us as a Pacific but, nation, but we, but we are. are. And yeah. if you visit Vancouver, you certainly will get the feeling For that maybe sure. we are an Asian nation or, or rapidly becoming yeah. one. Uh, so China, for its own reasons, will continue. And China feels aggrieved about how the world's regarded in that respect. They have quite a bit the same idea as Russia has. What about Russia? What, what adventurism do you see them pursuing this year? I think that they will continue to try to thwart Western goals in Syria and Iraq. They will continue to prop up the Assad regime which uh, uh, is really a pretty rancid bunch. Mm. Uh, and uh, they will continue, whenever it suits them, 
to stir the pot in Ukraine. Uh, the electricity uh, blackouts, attacking power grids through computers, uh, cyber warfare, and, and all these exercises that keep countries all the way from Finland uh, down to Bulgaria and Romania on sort of half alert. And these are countries without great resources who are, of course, asking the West and NATO for a lot more help. They want bases there. Uh, I think because the Russian economy is in bad shape, Putin faces a choice. Does he go a bit further to shore up support? His support isn't dropping much yet, but it will if the economic problem... I was just in uh, communication with somebody who lives in the Russian Far East in the last few days, uh, talking about how the ruble... Canadians may think the dollar is hurting, but the ruble's gone down 250% in the time the Canadian dollar's gone down 30%. Hmm. And that represents a huge problem for Russia. They're running uh, very, very big budget deficits and they're dipping into their savings. All their savings, and they had big ones, will be gone in the next year or two. So uh, Putin's choice is, do I try to do something maybe on Ukraine? But his bottom line is, that Crimea is ours forever. It's very hard for the West to accept. And you may remember the Baltic states. We in the West never accepted that those, uh, those states were part of the, uh, the Soviet, Union. Soviet Union ever. And I can see us 50 years from now having this conversation uh, when, because of all these new wonder drugs and things, you and I will be uh, <laughs> well into our hundreds and we'll be discussing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, we must not recognize Crimea. But there may be some other opening. There is a chance Russia may make a bit of an opening, but I fear, just because of Putin's nature, that he'll stir the pot more somehow. Okay. Uh, In our last minute here, then, the biggest story floating under the radar for much of the world right now that you think we should be watching, what is it? I think we're watching the big ones, Steve, and they're all going to get bigger. They're going to get worse. Europe is in a total mess. It's not only about the refugees and how they digest all of these people and can they remain tolerant democratic societies. There's uh, uh, Italy is the next Greece. Everything's shaping up for another summer of potential big bailouts and all kinds of diplomatic wrangling. And will Britain leave the European Union? Will the European project even exist? There's that one. It's going to ex uh, accelerate, I think, in the next year. There's China and Russia causing trouble. And then, Steve, every year I come and talk to you, there are surprises. We didn't know, maybe we knew there was a refugee crisis, but we didn't know it would manifest itself in the way it did in Europe. Quite Just true. like if you and I had met in the year 2000, or 2001, we could not have predicted that Canada would spend a decade in Afghanistan and billions of dollars of Canadian mm. money there, and it happened. So who knows this year? Things could happen also in Latin America. Matthew, I'm not inviting you back anymore unless you bring some good news next time. And never, never. never if you good travel, news on the world stage. you end up being a hell of a cynic, I tell you. <laughs> I hear you. Matthew Fisher, uh, Canada's longest-serving foreign affairs correspondent with Post Media. We uh, thank you very much for your annual trip to our studios well, thank you, here Steve. in Midtown Toronto. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.